Well, the, if you compare that age, this, the 70s, with the films today, it's incredibly different. Um, the films of the 70s were, not all of them, of course, but there were, they were, there was alienation and irony. Um, and when I looked at them, did all this rethinking of this, visiting back to the past and uh, tasting the wine, and it was still tart and kind of bittersweet at this point. But uh, how many films at that time had negative or downbeat endings? You very seldom see that today. I'm just going to go through a quick, quick list, and this is just the, the top of the of the, of, of the top, uh, subject. Godfather 2, five, five easy pieces, he's alone. Nashville ends in an assassination. Dirty Harry, he throws away his badge. King of Marvin Gardens, the Bruce character, Kurt, uh, character is shot. Chinatown, Mean Streets, uh, Taxi Driver, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, in, ending up in the drug uh, den. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He, at least his, his image, is still alive, but he's dead and gone. Conversation, The Candidate, uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, and Hitchcock made one of his fr- one of his most negative endings. I mean, we think immediately of of Psycho and The Birds, but the one that may be the most negative and and the sense of human nature being devastated um, is Frenzy, which was in that. And and our friend uh, Kubrick, Barry Lyndon with uh, Ryan O'Neill, what happens to him at the end. So you go through all of these mm-hmm. masterpieces or near masterpieces, the, the, and they the parallax, ended... The, the parallax yeah. view comes to mind. Sure, you know, the parallax view Warren would Betty be gets, another one. Warren Betty gets shot in the face at the very last well, I think, of that film. I, I, think, I think one of the things about why I so much liked the Coen brothers... Inside Llewellyn Davis was my best picture this year. Is it's it's a '70s picture. It has the texture. It has the rhythms. It has the qualities. It it also has the the alienation and the irony that are so absent from so many films today. I mean, how can you be ironic about a celebrity culture? I, I don't see how you can. It's it's. It, the, 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 you cannot be you you can't be ironic about so much that is absurd, and irony has melted away or has just disappeared from so many of our films. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So here's the premise to to let our listeners know. Um, I came to you last week and I said, hey, why don't we pick five movies each from the decade of the seventies? Uh, no, uh, there's there's no. Uh, What's the word for it? A prerequisite. There's no sleep. I haven't slept since. (laughs) (laughs) You know, whatever you'd like to talk about, whatever five movies, they could be random, they could be your favorite, they whatever, Uh, and let's see what comes out of it. I don't know your choices. You don't know mine. So this is exciting. Maybe I haven't seen your some of your choices, and it'll bring up interesting discussions. So. Without you have mind. seen them all, my man, and you've interpreted <laughs> them all, and you've lived no, them no, all. No. So don't you, play you, this you, game with me. No, you, you'd be surprised. I, I have some blind spots. So, uh, and that's why I depend on, on on movie fanatics like you, so I can so I can fill in those blind spots. So I am not more. a fanatic. I am not a fanatic. <laughs> I'm an intelligent, perceptive viewer. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. So give me your for, your your first uh, choice that you wanted to discuss. Okay, the, the this could be forty different films. I mean, they've been fighting me um, for the last few days for a, a place on the list, and I've replaced two, and I've replaced three, and then I've moved one up and I've moved one down. But the number five is a film that was made in twenty-seven days for five hundred thousand dollars. In 1973, and it was the first time that Scorsese had ever met Robert De Niro, and they went on to make eight 
films together. And my pick of that is Mean Streets. And there's so much, the, the work still has Scorsese's spirit. I think if you if you mention the, the five most Scorsese films, the, the ones with his personality and his character and his creativity, that's got to be on the list of five. And he actually appeared in it himself. They, they made it non-union. It was, as I said, low, low, low budget. Um, he played the henchman who sits in the back of the car and at the end shoots um, Charlie and, and Johnny Boy uh, De Niro. Mm-hmm. So it was it I, one of the major things, maybe the most major thing of the films of the 1970s was the personal vision, and particularly the personal vision of the director. And this, especially the first five years, but it was the golden age of the personal vision of of uh, the director, of the creator, before money changed everything. And I was talking about this on the show the other night, <clears throat> when it comes to directors and their particular styles, uh, we were talking about Wes Anderson. Wes Anderson has a very particular style that he's built over the course of his career. And I, I heard an interview with him, and he said, you know, after a while and making so many movies, I just realized, well, this is the way I, I like to see things. This is the particular way I like to frame them. It's, it, I just happened upon my vision. It wasn't something that was conscious from the beginning. But then you have directors that seem fully realized, fully formed, right out of the gate. I mean, Orson Welles would be one, and and Scorsese would definitely be another because all the hallmarks are there in in Mean Streets or even earlier with Who's That Knocking at My Door, but particularly right. Mean Streets. Well, I don't think vision is – it may evolve, but right. that's why I – Love Scorsese, and I'm afraid that Wes Anderson leaves me kind of uh, remote. I, I just cold. can't get yeah. yeah, I just can't get involved in him because he's more. I don't want to say get. Well, I guess I, I would say it. He's kind of more like a gadfly, and Scorsese's a, a wasp, or if there are, if there's such a thing in in New York. Or uh, something that gnaws and attacks, and there's a there's a there's a visceral spirit to him mm-hmm. that simply doesn't exist in the humanity that Wes Anderson puts on the screen. And I really don't want to want to denigrate Anderson, but in a sense, if we mention them both, I just don't think in any way they're equals. They're both creators, right. but I, one I, I, I is don't it, either. I was just using what? that to illustrate kind of the the establishment of a personal vision, and uh, where Wes Anderson said his his grew over a period of time. Uh, it's it seems to me that Scorsese he knew exactly the kind of filmmaker he was right when he started. I mean it it's blaringly obvious that the visceral camera movement, the use the the use of popular music that really set a context for for the scenes. Um, and the terrific but, actors that he had too. Yeah, yeah. Do you um, did you see Mean Streets? I'm sure you did. For, first run when it first opened in '73. Yes, I did. Now here here's a, here's a story. I don't think I've ever told you about it. That I was at the New York Film Festival way back when, and I saw this short subject that I could not watch. I could not keep my eyes on the screen. It was about a man shaving mm. and cutting himself, and the blood kept falling into the sink. And it wasn't until years later that I found out that the Scorsese had made that short that first appeared way before anything else at the uh, New York Film Festival. And I was so lucky to get to know Marty because he sent me from the film series that I was having in Dayton, he sent me his a, a personal copy of Italian Americans with his mother and father. And wow. I showed it and it, it was a tremendous, tremendous hit. So that that his whole life, his whole spirit his, was was film and creativity and, and what it means for the human condition. 
Well, if you, I love you, Marty. I, just, I love you, Marty. <laughs> I I sure love him too. But you know, if you, I just watched Who's That Knocking for the first time last week, um, and it's so painfully obvious that his church was the cinema. Just from watching that movie, ninety percent of the conversations that transpire in that movie are about movies. Uh, you know, between Harvey Keitel and his the the woman that he's wooing, uh, he just had it in his in his blood. Uh, what do you think is his crowning achievement? In, oh, his crowning and his his enduring and prevailing. I mean, how many times did he, has he has he taken shots? I I I just think he, he is a great masterly filmmaker and not every film appeals to me not every film works because he tries different things he tries a musical he tries a comedy he he has violence he has a romance but it is he's the whole he's the whole tapestry and yeah. when i in this time that i revisited i think i like scorsese 25% more than I did a week ago just by going back and revisiting and refeeling and understanding we talked one time about the context the context of the man's work and of the man's man's spirit um one of the things that when when remember the the 70s we're going to, 40 years ago this is 40 years ago that the man has uh, been vital and vibrant and experimental and original and unique and all of those things. But at that time, when he grew up and when I grew up, there was a whole sense of cinema as a new thing that was waking up, that the French had discovered things and passed it into the American, not the mainstream, but the American creative spirit. And I, I, I looked recently on a uh, list of the 25 greatest critics that somebody had come up with, one of these net pe- people, and Kaufman wasn't on the list, and Dwight McDonald wasn't on the list. And when we, when we would, people would buy The New Yorker and read Paul and Kale's reviews, not because they were going to see the movie. They just loved the way she she wrote, and sure. John Simon was a tremendous. He was a son of a bitch, but he was a tremendous um, interpreter. And Stanley Kaufman was great on the acting in cinema. And there was there were fights. There were tremendous fights that you would you would hear about even if you were teaching in Ohio or living in Omaha or in California, whatever wherever between Saris and Kale going going at each other. And so they so film criticism and the whole sense of something that was alive and uh burgeoning uh was was distinctive. And he, remember also that back at that time film was still struggling or still they weren't people were not accepting it as an art form. That that very few colleges, except UCLA and USC and NYU, had a film course at all. There wasn't such a thing as, as, as film teaching. When I went into education, and after many, many years, and then I've taught almost everything and every approach to film, but it, it, it wasn't what people accept today. When I t- did the experimental course on Clint Eastwood, I mean, we, we're teaching John Milton and Shakespeare, and you're going to bring Clint Eastwood into the English part, department? No, no, you're not. And I did it with great trepidation. Now, it was later than the 70s with Eastwood. But the, the course worked because he was an artist working in an art form that had layers and levels and took you down roads that you didn't expect. Well, and you bring up film criticism, it was also an era where uh, film criticism came to the forefront as its own art form. I mean, at least in retrospect now, 
when I read, I say, well, this this was the time when it was taken seriously because I think that the movies uh, took themselves uh, the, the 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 movies engaged in the world in, in a way that d- demanded respect and attention. But Pauline Kael and Roger Ebert were, were major players in. Uh, further establishing uh, Scorsese. I mean, they they really shined a spotlight on his early work. Oh, absolutely. And and in fact, Kale became the great uh, promoter of Robert Altman's work. That right. and w- one thing I also realized was the that there were so many of these directors that were prolific. I left films off my list by both of these directors and I love both of them and they were Altman did 11 movies in the 1970s he did 7 in the first 5 years Sam Peckinpah did 9 movies in the 1970s can you imagine anybody Woody Allen maybe but other than Woody Allen making a film a year or even more than a film a year today where there's a fight for big budget Here's another thing that I wanted to, to bring in. I'm, I'm almost too excited <laughs> or too, too excitable. <laughs> Give me the vodka, please. Pass me the vodka. <laughs> uh, but when you when you compare what film does today, it's made for a different market. Most of the films today are made for the overseas market. Avatar has made 73% overseas, only 27% domestically. Frozen now is going crazy overseas. There is a film that opened in China on, let me, I have the number of screens down, it's over 6,000, 6,265 screens in this theater and had, a week ago, made 20 million, $20.5 million. Do you have any idea what it was? In China, no. RoboCop. Oh, the remake. RoboCop is appearing in 6,265 screens in China. It's made twenty more than $20 million in that country. And they changed that the film over there to a special 3D version to satisfy the market. So they're not making films anymore for Americans. That's why that's why we don't see good scripts. The dialogue doesn't matter. Instead well, sure. of a sentence you have an explosion, well instead of a sentence you have 10 explosions. But well, but language you know, and, has been blown away. Pardon me. And and personal vision which Scorsese had from the very beginning uh, with with a movie like Mean Streets I mean, that stands in sharp contrast to what came before it as well, because uh, this wasn't a studio movie like Hello, Dolly, which seemed like completely out in the ether. Like, what? who are they trying to appeal to with this? This was a guy that said, this is the world I know, th- th- and, and I'm going to, to tell it through, through, through m- my prism of experience. Um, and that's the very definition of a personal vision. And when when you have to make a movie for China and India and 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 every other country on the planet, it has to satisfy each of those audiences. How, how can you make a film of personal vision? I, I mean, well, actually, this, one of the, one of the things that's surprising is that personal vision was not recognized before the '60s or '70s in this country. Certainly, Hitchcock has a tremendous personal vision, but it's hidden. But now you go back and you see all of the different themes that he's working over and over again, and there's an intelligence at work, and there's symbolism, and there are motifs. We didn't recognize them. They were, we were oblivious to the depth, and somebody like Hitchcock, who I have tremendous respect and admiration for kind of beat the system because he he offered a film that would satisfy the audience in this country not caring that much about the foreign market but back then but also he would put in in a film that was marketable and commercial he would put a lot of 
innuendo, a lot of suggestion, a lot. He would surreptitiously uh, make make points and and deal with themes. And it's fascinating today yeah. to go yeah. back and open up Hitchcock. Hitchcock is endless. He is he is just wonderful. It is such a delicate line to toe between maintaining not compromising a personal vision and yet making it accessible for as many audiences as possible and i that's what fascinates me about this this later stage of scorsese's career probably for the first time he is one of our most bankable directors at, at the stage of his career which is amazing to me and and he's making films i mean wolf of wall street is not compromised in any way, <laughs> you know, and, and yet it's it's making huge business. And and sure, I, I'm sure that a lot of that has to do with his pairing of DiCaprio. But uh, if 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 it wasn't for, but don't you don't you don't you think that that Marty Scorsese has a a, a really intent ear on the marketplace and on commercial commerciality today, and knows that there are some risks he can't take and and realizes that he has to compromise. And even though the vision is a strong one and there are some personal qualities in it, I think there's also a sense of the marketplace that makes the film much different than it would be without having to um, appease the gods of mammon. Yeah, but I don't think that he does anything he doesn't want to do. I mean, I honestly think that he's very careful at choosing what projects he wants to do, and he'll be the first one to say, "No, that movie's not me." I mean, that right. that's not something that I would do. Right. I, he he wouldn't compromise himself in that way just to keep working. He's in a, oh, no. he's in a great spot. Uh, let me uh, say my first pick. This is one of my favorite movies, and you talk about Scorsese. Here's another quintessential uh, New York filmmaker, and that's Sidney Lumet. Uh, Dog Day Afternoon is one of the most astounding movies for me, and it contains my all-time favorite performance, and that's Al Pacino in that film. The, some of the things that really strike me about it is on, on, on the level of the screenplay, here is a guy um, that Pacino plays that, that you, know, you learn so much about in the course of the film – and by the time the film's over, you realize that there's so much more you have yet to know about him that you re that you really want to know about him. And I, I, very few movies nowadays leave you wanting to know more about the people that populate them. Um, and, and that's either because they they spill everything about them or they're not that interesting to begin with. Um, but these characters are intensely interesting. And and at the same time, Lumet paints a really vivid portrait of uh, a city on fire. Uh, you know, a, a, a feeling in the streets of of revolt. Um, I, it's a, it's a movie I adore. Uh, I, I watch it every year. I, I'm sure you love it too. I, I, one of the things that I that's also interesting about it is his name, John Casale. Yes, who plays the the guy who's going to get the operation. Sal, John no, Casale. Uh, Chris Sarandon is the guy that gets the operation. John oh, that's Cazale right. Is his, is his cohort, his buddy. Uh, the, that's what. That's yeah. right. That's right. Well, you know, he would. He died very early of cancer, and he was supposed to be a great actor, and he was the boyfriend of that at that time of Meryl Streep, mm -hmm. and she she really nursed him. Uh, th through the days of his of his death, um, and he might have been a major. Well, he would have been a major um, character actor for sure. Probably, possibly, potentially a star as well. But the 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 Lumet is a great director. I, I, I I'm very fond of him. Well, Pacino has said they made a documentary about John Cazale a couple of years ago, and, and in that documentary, Pacino said. You know, I learned the most about acting from working with Cazal because they were very close friends. The two of them, uh, they did, uh, of course, the Godfather movies together right. too. But um, 
uh, Kazal was amazing, and he probably had the most amazing career of any actor. He made five movies. Each one of them was a masterpiece. It, the two Godfathers, Dog Day Afternoon, The Deer Hunter, and The Conversation. Those were his five movies. I mean, could you imagine? That is just jaw-dropping. Well, one of the things about him was that he wasn't ostentatious. You almost didn't know how good he was because he 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 made his characters so human that it you kind of missed the artistry and the 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 timing and the ability that he that he created that he rendered to his characters. Well, and there's a moment in Dog Day that he has, and I believe it was improvised. It's a line, that, the funniest line in the movie, when uh, when Pacino's talking to him and saying, "Where do you want to go? We can go to any foreign country. They'll fly us out of here. We've made the deal. Let's do it. Where do you want to go?" And he thinks for a while and he says, "Wyoming." And it's a funny, li- it's a funny line, but yeah. he plays it in a way that really clues you in on the tragedy of that character. Because this is a guy that... He's not making a joke of it. No, no. It's a funny moment that becomes a heartbreaker the more you kind of examine it. Uh, And those are the layers that I live for in in movies. And I don't get enough of now, but certainly in this era I did. uh, What they would probably say is, you can't say Wyoming because we don't have an audience big enough in Wyoming. So you have to say, say something else. That's yeah. what the producers would tell him. And also, a side note, they've made a documentary about the real Sonny, uh, the real bank robber. Oh. Uh, oh. It premiered at a festival last year, and so I'm sure it's going to come around soon, but I, I can't wait to see that. Because he, he was living uh, up until a few years ago, and he said that the movie Dog Day got some things wrong, but he said at the same time he's he's thankful for the infamy. <laughs> that the movie, the movie <laughs> You know, uh, and it was the first mainstream movie to to re- in a way. I think Freakin's movie probably came out before the boys in the band, but to to where a major movie star was playing a homosexual, mm-hmm. uh, which which was another thing that made it kind of a groundbreaking uh, movie. Well, well, Rock Hudson was, but we didn't notice it. Yeah, you know, we didn't. They had that kind of under wraps. <laughs> uh, okay, your second film, Tony. All right, I, and I apologize to your audience that I got too excitable about uh, about no, that's this film. Love. I, I will be more. Uh, I will be more uh, uh, sedate on this. <laughs> I'm a Philadelphian. I'm born and raised. Went to Villanova. Um, my fourth is Rocky. Now you might say, "Whoa, what, what's this, what's he doing with Rocky?" Rocky is. Again, a form a formulative film in the uh, '70s was directed by John C. Avildsen, and he went. He just went back to Philadelphia and um, was standing by the Rocky statue at the art museum. And people would ask him to move. They wanted to take a picture of Rocky, and somebody was trying to sell him a T-shirt. Uh, in Philly for Rocky, so Avelson? and he's the director. Then nobody knows him. Nobody knows John C. Avelton. and he really Stallone wanted to direct it. He was insistent on directing it, but they wouldn't make it. With they they let him act in it, but and they let him write it. Although the first the initial draft was naturalistic and a lot of cursing, and you know, it wasn't a it wasn't a fairy tale at all. And in the original, as they were making the film, Avelton has said Stallone was such a starving artist; he would do anything. I mean, he would he would listen. He would be. You can't imagine him listening to anybody else today. He would be obedient. He would be. And and Avelton said, of course, there weren't cell phones back then, so it was an easier thing to do. But the film was supposed to end with Rocky. Sitting on the stool in the in the locker room, defeated, and then they put in the the Adrian the love affair, not the love affair, the moment of where he's he's calling to her and and she's running down the down the, down the arena steps, and so Avildsen was so important to the Rocky um, franchise. 
because he started it, and he won the Oscar for Best Director, and it won Best Film. And it's 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 a film that that you have to suspend your disbelief. Yes, of course, but I think it it is one that deserves you're suspending your disbelief and rewards it. And that that I think there are some people who probably hate it, but I think a lot of us just just go along with it and it's it's a feel good movie but it has humanity to it the humanity is what sets it apart for me the two things set it apart for me um <clears throat> the first thing is that the real life that revolved around that movie and getting it made and the tremendous success it enjoyed really mirrors the story of rocky i mean stallone fought he stuck to his guns. He wanted to be in that movie. He believed in it. He was broke. They offered him a lot of money for the script, but he said, no, I have to be in it. Um, and he knew that was his shot, and it was wildly successful. And Stallone was a rocky story from that movie. Um, and the second thing... One I of the things you can do, one of the things you can do today is say rocky, and everybody knows what you're talking about. It's part yeah, of our culture. I, I think so, yeah, and I think that that's why people uh, don't appreciate the, the, the purity of that first movie as much as they should, because it's become such a part of the culture now that people have forgotten just how powerful that was, uh, that first film was. And I, I think the f main thing that makes it powerful is that love story, the, the tenderness of that love story between he and Adrian just, uh, I mean, it sounds corny, but it melts me every time. I think that's the well, key. Well, when I was making up this list, I, it, it spoke to me. He, it was, yo, Adrian, yo, Tony. And so I had to yeah. I had to put it on my <laughs> list. He imagined he was calling out to you. From the Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's still very relevant. I mean, they just opened up the Broadway uh, musical yes. of Rocky last week. And, and, and people Which I hear crazy. has a, it's, it's not that good, but has a dynamite ending where they use all these pyrotechnics, and it's it's supposed to be it got a standing yeah. ovation. The 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 last part of it when there's a fight and and it's it's very dramatic, theatrical. Yeah, yeah, I'd be interested in seeing it, but um, yeah, that's a that's a that's an awfully sweet, uh, effective movie, uh, and anyone that's so jaded as to not see the value in that movie. I don't want to know them. Um, there, I said it. Uh, my second movie... <laughs> excuse me. My second movie is also one of my favorites, and it's my favorite Marlon Brando performance, and that's Last Tango in Paris. Um, I think... Uh, I, I love this movie from the first time I watched it as a teenager. I probably shouldn't have watched it at that age. <laughs> but... Uh, and I saw beyond the – because I'd read a lot about it. Obviously. You never saw Butter the same, even when you were a child, right? No, but <laughs> I, I did read – the prelude to me watching the movie was reading Kale's review. And then I read other stuff about it, and I was prepared for a, a very extreme, titillating movie. Um, but I, for me, that – in terms of English language films, that movie deals more honestly with sexual relations than any other film I've ever seen because the the, the sexual contents of the movie truly mirror uh, truly mirrors the um, the psychology of the characters uh, and and his need to degrade uh, mirrors kind of how how completely dead he feels inside that he can't feel her complete openness and innocence and uh, and, and I love the the camera and the camera is tangoing throughout the film it just has this sweeping romantic quality even when most of it takes place in this single room and the colors in the room change throughout the course of the movie from like a like from different shades of pink flesh color and 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 Brando is so um Completely raw in that well, movie. Or at least the, 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 the death, appearance. the recent death of uh, Philmer Seymour Ho Philip Seymour Hoffman, yeah, makes me see what how 
daring and risk-taking. I mean, I always knew it. But how these actors, like Brando, in a you use the word raw, in a raw part, takes such a chance, takes such a leap, and becomes the character, sees all of the all of the vulnerabilities, feels all of the abilities, vulnerabilities, lives them, and I, I think that Hoffman's death has really a way. I, I knew acting is taking risk. I knew it's daring, and I knew it's danger. It can be dangerous, and I knew it's it can be it can be overwhelming, and and it can be obsessive. But when you see Brando live the character, and the character, he becomes the character. Uh, that's a rare and sublime experience. It really is. And talking about working on different levels, there's a scene in that film, probably outside of the butter scene, it's the most famous scene, where he's sitting at his dead wife's bedside. <clears throat> and he begins to curse her, uh, viciously curse her, until he kind of dissolves into a pool of tears on her dead body. And it, 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 it goes from calling her all these obscene names to saying, I don't know why you left. Why did you do this to me? So, And he's he's acting on different levels, particularly in that scene, because even as he's saying the most foul things to her, he's professing his love for her. Uh, but it's also it's also it's not just acting. Acting almost limits it. it it's, it's experiencing it. We yeah. experience the moment because he is experiencing it. it. We don't quite know what he's going to do next because there is mm-hmm. maybe he doesn't either because he's so in the character. And it's also the last time he was he he looked virile. You know, he was just starting mm-hmm. to get a, a, a little bit of a punch on him, but uh, he still had that magnetism that we associated with the Brando before that. And it came right after The Godfather. Put those two performances up against one another. How is that the same person? Right. Uh, it's remarkable. Ugh. So, yeah, I've always been – and I'm always the first to defend it because I know a lot of people that think it's just a filthy, worthless movie – uh, but I'm saying no. It actually, it actually. And what do they think of, about you then? <laughs> oh, well, they, 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 yeah, their conclusion of me is usually dead on. But uh, but you look at any American movie that deals with sex, and they don't deal with sex. They pretend to deal with it. They they're dealing with the titillation and the, and the surface of it. They don't talk about how sex is is an extension of who we are and how we communicate who we are. Last Tango understands that, and that's why I love it. Well, some of us have a longer extension than others. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, on that note, give me me your third movie. My third movie is, is, uh, again, one I wouldn't have put on my top list during the 70s. But going back and seeing how it has evolved and its maker... Makers have evolved. My third is uh, 1971, Dirty Harry. Mm -hmm. And my initial reaction was that Clint Eastwood has a few dimensions, and it is a visceral film. Uh, It has has, uh, violence in it. But, again, it is one of those films that is so... Uh, formative that Siegel Clinton Eastwood learned from Siegel the layers the film is not just I, I'm, I, I've written an article a long time ago and I was hoping it was I couldn't find it on my website so I'm going to send it and put it back on my on my web, website uh, uh, about the values of Dirty Harry and it has it has the doppelganger. It has the double theme that Harry is supposed to be this heroic figure, anti-heroic, and Scorpio is is evil, just horrible. And yet, there's a sense that they are two sides of one character. That Harry's wife has been killed on a uh, on in a car accident, but when he he when the pedestrians are crossing in front of him, he he, he curses them. 
He says, "Get out of my way!" You know, the hammerheads. What? 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 what there is a great shot. There are a lot of things. There are a lot of sequences that show Harry in the same kind of action, in the same kind of setting as Scorpio. Um, and there's this wonderful shot at the near the end, in the, in the, near the conclusion, where they're in on the school bus. And Scorpio's on top, and and Harry's in in the the uh, bus, and the window, the the the, the front the windshield, there, Scorpio is, leans down with his pistol, and Harry has his pistol pistol, and they're mirror images. There is a mirror image of the two of them, and at the end of the film, which it's like the frontier is dead that. It's in a mind, and in the far distance, you see traffic on the highway, uh, and he kills Scorpio and throws away his badge, and his badge number is 2211. So the two, be, they both become individuals. So he's killed his alter ego. And the values of America, the the antique shop is next to an adult, re, uh, adult uh, bookstore, and both have American flags, and there is a. It's just a film that is. Um, it was so significant, I think, in the in the launching and the the development of Clint Eastwood's ability to be a a great director himself. Uh, I w- I saw. Um, Play Misty for me the other night, and I was really surprised about how good that was. The director Don Siegel has a small part in it as a bartender, but he helped he helped uh, Clint make that film. And it, when you think back to the 1970s and 1971, you think this guy is not going to win an Oscar, much less the impossibility of him winning two Oscars for director. And that's what his do- he's done. His career has just evolved and evolved and evolved into an incredible legacy. And I think that Dirty Harry is a film that um, has qualities that are that that are that und- undiscovered qualities. How much of that subtext do you think came from Siegel, and how much came from Eastwood? I mean. I think most of, almost all of it came from Siegel, probably, and the writers too. The yeah. uh, the uh, 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 husband and wife who wrote the film script. Now we don't know. We really don't know what uh, how much of it did. But I think the important thing is that we learn from people, and he learned from Siegel mm-hmm. how to mm-hmm. make a movie, and how to make a movie that wasn't just superficial. You can go through all of his films and see. You don't think of, of Clint Eastwood making films that have Christ figures in them, but they do throughout. And there's a sense of um, there's a sense of, in, of of interpreting of interpretation that the filmmaker does himself in his films. And you can go and follow and explore the the doors that he's left open for you. So I would say. Siegel gets the most credit, obviously, because because Eastwood's still young and and still developing, and and um, but he certainly Eastwood certainly was a terrific pupil. Well, Eastwood credits a lot to Siegel, um, with, without question. But you know, detractors of that film and the series, the Dirty Harry series in general. <clears throat> approach it like some kind of knee-jerk um, conservative fantasy. <clears throat> do you f- do you see that, or do you see it more of? A, no, I see why they do it? because it's a superficial view of the film. I mean, certainly, I was I didn't like the film much when I when I saw it because it just seemed to be violence for violence's sake and braggadocio and and uh, ego and aggressiveness. And Pauline Kael called it uh, fascism. 
and I wasn't a fan of, of kale, but uh, I certainly re- read what she said and thought of, and thought a lot about it. But I think once you get, it's like saying Hitchcock, he just makes films of or suspense. <laughs> no suspense happens to be the form, the genre, but but there is there is a tremendous amount of um, thematic substance to his film. A work of art is not superficial, and it often the surface deflects our interests of, and 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 our our uh, knowledge. We don't understand it. You can't mm. like what you don't understand. Mm. Um, I don't think you can. Or very seldom can you like what you don't understand. And what these people do is they make a, a, a impulsive, knee-jerk reaction. Uh, that's one of the things that drives me nuts about the modern c- culture. Here's a story. Here's, here, here's one that puts everything into perspective. I was at the donut shop the other day, my my local haunt, and there was a girl reading a book, and I asked her what she's, and she was a college student, and uh, taking an an English course. So we started to talk to her, and I gave her my brief brief primer about, about writing. This was a smart girl. This was a smart, fairly perceptive girl. We talked about language, and she she knew she got what I was saying, and she was able to respond. I said to her that I had done some film criticism. I said, "Your dad probably knows John Wayne." And she said, "Oh, you, you, I've heard of him. I know him." <laughs> she had not heard of the next person I mentioned. She said, "And this is this is a bright young woman in her early twenties. I have never heard of him. It was Clint." It was Clint Eastwood. Really? Yeah. Mm. What do you do with it? What do you do with that, Harry? <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's surprising. Um, I, I guess because as an actor, he hasn't been front and center for no the better no, part of this decade. Maybe that. And uh, and and certainly a young woman is not going to go see Gran Torino unless her boyfriend takes her, forces her to go. Yeah, so, that's but it's it. it, it it says it says something about changing populaces, changing tastes, changing knowledge. Well, uh, my third movie, you know, I've got a list of seven movies here, so I'm just ch- choosing which one. Oh, you cheater! <laughs> Can't do that. <laughs> well, you know what's what makes it so difficult is the, 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 what I found most delicious from the '70s were the <clears throat> the beautiful character studies. And there are several terrific candidates, um, including the. Well, then, am I able to do <laughs> my other thirty-five then? I'm, I'm only going to I'm only going to discuss five. I'm not going to cheat. Uh, oh, okay. I was just trying to decide between the conversation and five easy pieces. So uh, I think we've talked about five easy pieces before. So I'll talk about the conversation, which is no talk about list. five easy pieces because it's fourth. It was fourth on my list, and I knocked it off. Oh, okay. Let's okay, talk let me, about both of them. Talk about both of them. Re, let me redo that. Let's talk about five easy pieces. <laughs> no, we'll talk about uh, both of them. Okay, the five easy pieces in the conversation. These are two terrific character studies, very intimate portraits of of characters that that exist in 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 that particular time, and I think they they describe uh, they go a long way in describing who the American male was at that time. And uh, the 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 outsider, the loner, the person trying to find his identity and his way in the world, like Bobby Dupuis in um, Five Easy Pieces, or Harry Call in the conversation, uh, the ultimate eavesdropper who is so fiercely protective of his own uh, privacy, he 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 brings along his own tragedy. Um, and I just love in the conversation. It's my favorite Coppola film. Uh, and I, I just love the character details. I love, I love the idea that Harry Call throughout the movie wears a transparent raincoat. Uh, just little character, 
traits like that are just beautiful, beautiful. And the great directors bring out the little details that that illustrate a greater truth uh, of of their story and character. Um, well, both of both of these films had the themes that I mentioned were alienation, alienation and irony. Certainly, yeah. his his life and tearing up the there's an ironic destruction that goes on both psychologically and physically in the in the conversation and the irony of him of Bobby not being able to talk to his father or trying to talk to his father and his father being like God not hearing him and then at the end he's in a he's alone heading for Alaska um both of those both of those films are just steeped in the spirit of the films of the 70s. Yeah, and, and a certain a certain guardedness, a certain uh squandered uh, squandered life in a way, kind of like not reaching their full potential. Um it, it kind of permeates both of those characters. And also much like Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver, which I think is the third great character study of the 70s. Um I'm I'm intensely interested in the idea of what became of these people. Did that they ever find peace? Um, no, 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 absolutely not. And, and the the uh w- w- we should mention the director of uh Five Easy Pieces, Bob Rafelson. Yeah. What he did was he did one thing in that film that I thought was just wonderful. He had the girl play a, he had him play a song for the girl. Bobby's playing a song on the piano for the girl. And she, it's beautiful. We lo- oh, it's, it's love. It's a, and he pay, plays it badly. I mean, you wouldn't know it. A real musician, it takes a real musician to know it. It sounds great like uh, the new, all the talent shows that are on TV. It sounds effective. But it's really kind of tacky. It's really kind of gimmicky. And Bobby's knowing that he was playing something that wasn't good, and he was not playing it well. And this woman was just just in bliss about it. Talk about irony, the difference between the appearance and the reality. And uh, Bob Rafelson also directed a film that I... One one of my favorite films that I, I can't put on the list like this, but, but King of Marvin Gardens, where Nicholson mm-hmm. and Dern were were terrific in Atlantic in in Atlantic City, um, and full of again those basic themes. Well, I I think that we're still struggling for identity as much now as we were then, and. Uh, and I don't see that reflected in movies. No, First of all, I don't think we're. I, I don't. I'm not sure we are struggling for identity, because identity is tough. And you join a club, and you become Jesus Christ the CEO or Jesus Christ the banker, and that's your identity. Uh, people are not working at their identity. It's just the celebrity. Why do you want to be a celebrity? I just want to be known. Well, what for what? I don't know how what you what you're like, but it, it when anybody says gives me a compliment, I feel very very uh, un- uncomfortable with it. And if they were having a roast for me, I probably wouldn't show up. Um, and yet today, identity is so easy because you get the identity by a certain number of characters on the uh, on on Twitter I'm not against it totally but it it substitutes for depth it substitutes for sub substance and so the identity today and I hope this isn't just age and experience speaking although those aren't too too negative those are pretty positive qualities age not necessarily but but <laughs> that <laughs> That looking at 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 it today, it it just seems like uh, 
things are more superficial than they ever were. I think well, they are they now. Are. People think yeah. they know everything. They're experts on everything, and they know nothing. Yeah, I I, I agree with you, but I, I I still think there's there's a crisis of identity out there. And I, but I, I think what you're describing, how people go about go about becoming who they want to be, um, yes. I still think it stems from the same concerns, uh, from the same restlessness um, that that existed back in the back in the 70s i i just don't think people are i don't think people are as aware of the world that that's going on around them so they're a lot less self-aware and if we're talking about the 70s movies and something like five easy pieces i mean this is a period of time where the country didn't know what it was you know, the country was still kind of uh, uh, trying to identify itself out of all of this chaos. Like it, it, there, there was a definite kind of uncertainty that you saw in all the political cons- conspiracy movies from that decade, for instance. But, it, but it, also in the in the smaller, more intimate character studies of of people trying to define where am I going, what am I doing. Um, it, it, but the difference is, I think, I think in the, in the past. Uh, big business or the government or whatever it was would kill you, would crush you. To, na- to now it just exists out there and we we, we just avo- av- yeah, yeah, avoid it or accept it or, or make, our, make our bleats, an occasional bleat. Uh, but I, I think during the six, 60s and 70s, People had more sense of they could do something. Mm-hmm. Now it's almost like, well, how much can you earn, and that's it. I agree. Um, yeah, yeah. So, jeez. So Give me movies. Let, let's see movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, movies are all of this. That's what makes them so great. Uh, okay, fourth movie, Tony. What do you got? Well, this one I, I I tried to drop off, and it will not. It would not. It would not leave. It would. It would not leave. I have Godfather two. Um, okay, yes. Both Godfathers are important. Although I had a friend who went to the second Godfather with Coppola, the director, and he kept saying, "Slower, slower, slower." The second one, he Coppola makes with his personal vision. The first one he makes with personal vision, but having to prove himself and being very, very vulnerable and very, very uh, uh, insecure. Um, I I don't think there's any question that Godfather 2 is a better movie. Godfather 1 may be more entertaining, um, but... This was one of the films that ended with those dead leaves blowing across in front of the bench, and that's an indelible image of loss and hopelessness, abject um, emotional, psychological emptiness. Talk about it. So Godfather 2. Yeah, talk about an identity crisis. That's Michael Corleone at the end of that film, and the black eyes and the kind of contemplative stare. Oh, it's not an, it's not a crisis. It's it's all over. No, there's no crisis left. The crisis the crisis is gone. His brother's dead, and his family's dead. I mean, there. No, it's not. A, it's not. And and Godfather Three that came much later is again a personal film because couple is. Son had died, of, and he played his nice. daughter she, with her silent scream. He had the silent scream when she was killed, and it did. So, what, it, what, it, what does that last glance mean? I mean, what what does that last black-eyed contemplative look mean? In my, I context? don't think it's contemplative. I think it's empty. I mean, I, I, there is nothing. He's lost it all. Okay. Um, I mean, he he is. Maybe he wouldn't admit it on those terms. Maybe he said, "I had, I did what I had to do. I was pragmatic, fundamentally pragmatic. 
but it's cost him everything. It's cost him everything that is human or beautiful or has a potential or positive. It's all gone. So you don't you don't think that that Michael at the end of that movie is is, is self aware of his of his journey and what he's become? Oh, I think he's terribly self aware, completely self aware. That that no, how how would anybody with a half a brain not be aware at that moment? And in the in nature nature is the tableau. Nature is the 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 the, the loss of nature, the death of the of the leaves, the the grayness. The, no, he he he's no dumb man. I mean, he his brains have saved the family time after time after time. But some, but it cost and cost and cost, and he ended and ends again the image of alienation, and it's mm-hmm. alienation from the American dream in all of its promise. There's something, uh, I mean, that's my second favorite Pacino performance after Dog Day. And and th- there's something uh, so beautiful about what he does in that movie. He's so totally still. Uh, I, I think Pauline Kael described it as, a, as almost a completely immobile performance. And for someone to work from that, <clears throat> from from that stage, and and still kind of let you in, going on there, um, and, and make you recognize the tragedy of that character, it, it's powerful acting. I mean, a lot of times he's expressing everything with, using nothing. Um, the, the, those black eyes, and and you know the Pacino fury that he's become known for. Right. Right. He releases it maybe two or three times in Godfather 2. Very, very smart <laughs> moments. But, but you also have to give Coppola a whole lot of credit, of the credit, oh, sure. because yeah. of the, du- yeah. the direction. That's what that's what they decided. Obviously, there's a kinship in the, in the vision. Um, and there's a, Pacino is a perfect uh, vessel for that. There's a moment in that movie... Um, the conversation between he and Kazal, where they're outside, they're drinking banana daiquiris together, and and Kazal, you could tell Kazal wants to tell Michael, I, I betrayed you, uh, and he al- there's a moment when he almost does it, and Kazal pulls back and says, Why don't we? Why haven't we been talking more? Or something to that effect, and you see Pacino's eyes. And you read it in Pacino's eyes that he knows at that moment. Right. And the, and all the way through that movie, there's such beautiful unspoken – there's unspoken moments that y- you just read in the characters. And it's so well cast, and the people play so well together that you just feel it. It's in the chemistry of the room when they're together. There's a, uh, there's a tremendous feeling of desolation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh it, 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 have there ever been more beautifully cast films than those first two Godfathers? I mean, it's gorgeous. Um, okay, so I'll choose my last one. Since I did Conversation with Five Easy Pieces, that was three and four. Uh, now you had one more. Didn't you have seven? Isn't there a, no, 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 a, a side revealing. track you wanted to... No, I'm just Pardon revealing me? five. <clears throat> okay. I'm just revealing right. five, just like, just like you. Okay. Um, okay. At the end of the conversation, we'll just bring up titles that m- might have missed the for today. But, <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. My last choice is a director that fascinates me more than any other, um, and that's Bob Fosse. And the movie is All That Jazz. Wow. I can't, I can't think of a more. We're talking about Raw with Brando's performance. Uh, all that jazz is a is now the the a, the audience should know that uh, one of your favorite singers is Barry Manilow, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have to? I just want to put. I, I just I'm adding it. context here. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, this is complete. Barry Manilow was is so white bread compared to what all that jazz is. But uh, yes, it's hard to imagine Manilow with demons. But uh, all that jazz. Uh, is such a raw autobiographical film from Fosse, 
I, I think he was such an artist that this movie is so raw. It, 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 he's directing his own death, his own his own fears of death, uh, his own failings as a father and uh, as a husband and as an artist and the and the, as, as an addict. Um, and I just watch that movie, and I marvel first of all at the the energy of it, but just the painful honesty of it. And Roy Scheider is the, doubles for Bob Fosse in the film as the uh, the director and choreographer who's kind of losing control of his life. He's a workaholic. He's he does heavy drugs. He smokes and drinks all the time. He's just like Fosse, and he's had a heart attack, but he doesn't stop. He's completely self-destructive, and he knows it's going to cause his his death. And let me and ask Fosse, you a question. You can you can yes. cut this part. Okay. But did your own physical no. experience enhance this at all? No, I've 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 loved this movie for years and years. Um, oh, I knew that. No. I don't I don't mean that. I mean, but did it add a it, did it add a quality personal quality? It probably. Yeah, I mean, if if I if I think of it consciously like that, I'm sure that I am I am more susceptible to what that film, the portrait that movie plays, because I I had my own self destructive aspects as well that caused my heart attack. Um, but uh, you know, it's just it's so brave to me that he 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 shoots his own death as a thirty minute musical number with Ben Vereen. And it's that it's that mixture of the show business pizzazz with the darkest possible material you could imagine. You take those two elements and that's that's Fosse. That's that's his style. And that's what makes him so fascinating to me as a filmmaker. Um I I'm I've been just intensely fascinated with Cabaret and all that jazz and Star eighty. Uh, not so much Linny. Because I think Lenny's kind of a failed movie, but yeah, I uh, do too. But that trilogy is—I I look at that and I say, this is a man that bared himself on screen with more bravery than than most other directors I can think of. Um, so, and uh, what a shame that he wasn't able to make more movies. But he wasn't able to make more movies because he's the character and all that jazz. Those sure. people do not last long. <laughs> No, Keep her right. Around. Yeah. So talk about a personal vision. This is the, all that jazz is about as personal as you can get uh, f- from my perspective. Well, that's the key to the the seventies. I mean, that is the, that is the the personal vision that is meaningful. And the, and there's an, the the thing that you think about in Fosse that probably that I'm sure appealed to you was that it was all of this emotion and all of this color and but the thing that appealed perhaps even more than that was the intelligence yeah the intelligence well, of the movie it was the probing it was it was the it it was okay if i'm going to do this i i'm going to lay myself bare uh i i'm i'm going to i'm going to let the i'm going to let the buzzards pick my bones clean uh i'm i'm not going to sugarcoat this at all um, I just admired the hell out of that, and that's what makes uh, his films great art for me, and so revealing, uh, revealing every time you watch them. Um, yeah. So, uh, and it's interesting to me how Richard Roy Scheider, he didn't know anything about Broadway. He did not come from that world, and yet, the second he's on screen, I mean, he just exudes it. Uh, you would think that he was Mr. Showbiz, like for his whole life. It's an amazing performance. Richard Dreyfus was fired from the movie after one week because he and Fosse didn't get along. Uh, so it was almost Dreyfus. Well, it's a much better casting. Richard Dreyfus would not have. Let me tell you something about Richard Dreyfus. We're talking about the films of the seventies. Well, what what lurked? Under the water of the 70s, in 1975 was Jaws, which changed films forever. Mm-hmm. It, 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 t- it brought the blockbuster in. There's a moment in that film, I was talking about the negative downbeat endings. In Jaws, Dreyfus 
The shark has attacked. Dreyfus has gone under the water, and he is dead. And here is the moment that changes, that gives us movie false hope. Out of the water pops Dreyfus. Now, in any in any story with reality to it, it doesn't happen. But he, so the end, it was a feel-good ending. Now, it, it could have been a, 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 a man against nature, a tremendous uh, epic tale, but when he popped out out of the out of the water, film in a sense said, "Okay, we've had enough negative. We've had enough downbeat. From now on, we're not going to have as much. We're not going to allow as many personal visions with." Um, right. This, but don't with, you don't, with, don't don't you think the audience is the one that said that? Oh, yeah, of course. And I was happy. On my, my my heart leapt. My mind shut down. I uh, and that's there's a constant battle between emotion and and mentality. But in the in, we're talking about the personal films. But in the seventies, there was also the blockbuster that was going to destroy and end the personal film, the, the kind of personal film that there had been before. In 72 was Poseidon Adventure. In 74 was The Towering Inferno. And this huge, big um, kind of movie that would work with an overseas audience because it's it's flame and it's, uh, it's uh, quote, tragedy, unquote. But when you mention Dreyfus, that that always comes to me of him popping out of that water and he, and and saying, "Okay, the movies are going to change. We're going to we're going yeah. back to the to the to happier times." Yeah, I agree with you. But if, do I get if, to to mention my if, best film? <laughs> absolutely. But if if Jaws hadn't made money, uh, we would have many more years of. <laughs> of, the, of these kinds of movies that we're talking about, obviously maybe, maybe not. Ahead. Maybe they had run their course because a, a lot of them, a lot of these directors were becoming uh, Dennis Hopper, and, people, and uh, they were all becoming, in a sense, almost entitled and um, very, very egotistical. So yeah. that maybe the maybe the humanity that we loved so much in the first half of the seventies and was still alive in the last half of the seventies and is still alive every once in a while in movies these days and i i once I find myself in limbo or purgatory because I'm always arguing with the older folks that the movies are better today than they think they are, and I'm arguing with younger folks that you don't have any context. You aren't able to provide any context to it. You've seen mm-hmm. one movie, and and there are ten that have done it better, but that's the only one you know. And the private eye in film noir has turned into a vampire. Uh, so th- so I have, <laughs> where I, it, my whole life, I have loved alienation. Probably I was forced to, because... Uh, I am. Ne- I never seem to belong to any particular group. That uh, I'm always uh, iconoclastic. By the so way, so my, my uh, yes. Uh, uh, studio heads are listening to us talking right now, and and based on your suggestion, they're remaking the Maltese Falcon with vampires. Right. Now. <laughs> hey, so, it's a good idea. You have that, you have that to look for. I'm to I'm I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> really ready ready for. Uh, um, um, Citizen Werewolf. Yes. Uh, okay, your last your last film. Not, not Citizen Kane. You understood the illusion. I, under, I understand the joke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when you have to explain your jokes, you're pathetic, Macklin. <laughs> All right. My number one of the of and again it could change by the time I I hang up. Let's we stop this conversation. But my number one had. What I, who I feel is the actor of the 70s. Now, you could say De Niro, and De Niro certainly was paramount, but he went on 
to Raging Bull, which I think probably was his best performance. This actor gave his best performance. You might disagree which one it was, but he gave his best performance in the 70s. It was also a very personal film by the director who changed the ending because it, by changing it, it became a personal expression of grief and loss. And I'm talking about 1974 and Roman Polanski's Chinatown. Now, his wife in 69, Sharon Tate, had been murdered by the Manson clan. Um, the actor was Jack Nicholson, and I, I think he is, is sensational. Uh, you might prefer his Oscar-winning performance in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or King of Marvin Gardens or The Passenger, all of which were in the 70s. So he had... And, and of course, the, uh, the the two Rafelson films, Five Easy Pieces and uh, King of Marvin Gardens. So for me, he was the actor, actor that embodied the spirit of the 1970s with his alienation, with his, what you said, his outer, outsider quality, with the irony. And one of the things that made me dislike a film that almost everybody liked is when Nicholson did about Schmidt because it had no irony. It was Nicholson without irony. And it was like he lost his, he lost his soul. I mean, it, he's good in that film. It's a, it was a commercial popular film, but it wasn't the, the Jack that I knew and trusted, and, it, and and was so significant to the films of the 1970s. And 71, 74 was the year both of Godfather Two and Chinatown. What a year! Yeah, I've rewatched Chinatown, you know, probably for the tenth time uh, last year because it came out in a really beautiful Blu-ray. Uh, and that David Fincher does commentary on, uh, of all people. It's Fincher and Robert huh. Town talking in the commentary track. <clears throat> what a Well, Fincher dream. loves irony. Fincher yeah. Fincher's the director, yeah. who, one of the few directors who still seems to have a sense of irony. And what a, and, and I interviewed Robert Town about Chinatown when the thing came out, and uh, what a s- supremely just gorgeously crafted movie first of all um and well a couple right, of things was, about brown did did you talk about the changing of the ending that I in the ending because, in his ending evelyn lived yes um and of course in Pol- when polanski became the director it was almost impossible for her to live at the yeah. end and, and that was the uh, right choice. And, and Robert Town didn't think it was the right choice at the time, but uh, in retrospect, he's come to. Uh, yeah, he, yeah. The other thing, I, I think it's the film that I most like to teach because, as an educator, I can open eyes more in, about what goes on in that film. The 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 doubles, the the. Everything is two. There are two every, and and one is always spoiled. I'm, I'm, the mother, the daughter, both at the same, the 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 mother and the uh, the sister, the mother and the sister. Um, the 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 headlights or the real lights, one is out. Uh, the, the two dollar bill. I mean, there's all kinds. Of, it's one of those films that's most fraught with symbol, symbolism, and not symbolism that is, in, that is tacked on, but is generic, because there are two sides, good and evil. There are two sides, flaw and, and, and unflawed. There are two sides, um, um, positive and negative, that which succeeds and that which fails. And that is tremendously, it, it, it doesn't waver. And it's stylistically, it's stylistically so astute in using the 
double uh, the duality. I, I, I guess I prefer the film dualities in in Chinatown to work with the dualities and what they mean. Ex- discover first of all, discover them, and they're like thirty thirty to forty of them, and then what they mean to understand, to comprehend, to explore their meaning. And that is a film that's, uh, that, that, that just is brilliant in, in emotionally and stylistically. Well, and it's the first movie, as you mentioned, uh, you know, comes on the heels of the, his wife being murdered. That's the first movie that Plansky made in the States after his wife was murdered. And the last one, because he had to flee a couple of years later. Right, uh, right. So he's Polanski does just a masterful job at, at adhering to the the stylistic and the the structural um, traits of a classic film noir, uh, but using those in the service of a very very dark <laughs> film. Yeah. I mean this this is a band that isn't only raping the land; he's raping his own blood. Uh, I mean the, 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 uh, it's it's the haunting haunting. But 50% of the audience leaves. What did he say at the end? What did he say? He said, it's Chinatown, Jake. It's it's Chinatown. What's that mean? What's that mean? Another another Nicholson character that that leaves at the end of that film in complete limbo. Oh, Uh, no, no. Hell, hell. Forget limbo. There's no limbo for him. Limbo is the the land of lost souls or or, uh, the unbaptized. He is in hell. He is. He is. I. I, I mean, it's not. I. I, I there, there may be ennui, and there may be a, a loss of, of feeling, and that's that's what you may mean by limbo. But it's well, I, I it's, mean exactly it's, it's excruciating. Said. It's yeah, excruciating. I, 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 I mean exactly what you just said that he's a lost soul. I mean because bef- before he took this case, he was he was trying to recover from. If I remember this plot correctly, he was trying to recover from a past incident, wasn't he? Yes, yes, he, yes, he 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 didn't save an, another woman. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he's guilt-ridden, which is also a, a, one of the themes that we we could add on and the guilt that is yeah. so much a part of so many of these characters. Um, the guilt of not belonging, the guilt of of, of failing, the guilt of of being, uh, of making mistakes, of, of doing the wrong thing, going to, down the wrong lane. Do we want to talk, uh, Ed, the ones, that, a few of the, the other titles? Yeah, just just mention the titles that you that you had. And well, uh, uh, I had uh, five easy pieces, which we talked about: King of Marvin Gardens, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Antonioni's The Passenger. Um, all the yeah. president's men. You can't forget Star Wars because that is the only film in the top hundred that has made. It, it's the only American film uh, of the seventies that has made the top hundred in foreign grosses. Uh, hmm. The Star Wars, and then um, mean of uh, of uh, Night Moves. Yeah. Do you remember Night oh. Moves? Oh, talk about yeah. a great Private Eye movie! I mean, that right. a beautiful movie. Oh, I love that film. Yeah. Um, y- y- you and the ballad. That. One of my favorite. I mean, I, I don't want to. Almost all of Peckinpah's films. Almost all of Altman's films. Ballad of Cable Hogue is one of my favorite Peckinpahs. Um, Junior Bonner. I love Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Is one of I, I think a, 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 ter- a great film, and then. Altman, uh, name an Altman film from the 70s that the 11 films that he made, uh, any of them, Brewster yeah. McCloud, MASH, Miss Cabin, Mrs. Miller, Images, Long Goodbye, Thieves Like Us, Nashville, Buffalo Bill and the Indians, Three Women, Not a Wedding or a Quintet, but all of the others. Well, uh, Cuckoo's Nest was <clears throat> the first movie that made me fall in love with movies. I remember watching it as a little a little kid, and uh, I think that that movie is so relevant to today as well because, um, I mean, it's really about a big uh, the the big system 
suffocating every ounce of dignity and individualism out of <laughs> out of everyone it touches and you know we have that today um and, and I, I think it's just a beautiful uh story i've always been attracted to that story um I had uh, McCabe and Mrs. Miller is one of my all-time favorite movies. It's probably in my Mine top too. five of all time. It really? has such has such an indefinable quality about it. There's there's such a melancholy beauty about that. Well, film. well what makes it well, one of the things that adds to the melancholy is the the music by Leonard Cohen. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just wonderful. It's just haunting. It's a quality and, and also to the, it. That, the the fact that the, that that you feel like like in the best Altman films you feel life kind of growing around the actual movie the fact that they built that town as they were shooting the film so it was the whole community was growing in the process of making the film I mean it, it becomes a living thing um, he he has a way of adding elements that very like intangibly alter the chemistry of the movie. Um, yeah, I love Altman. Uh, Shampoo is one that. Yes, that was on my list too. Uh, just, just as. How a, about being there? How about being there? I love. I first of all, I love Ashby, and and I I, I love being there, and I love Shampoo. I, I watched that again last week as well, and just on the simple basis of a travel log of L.A. at that particular period of time, I mean that's a great L.A. movie. Well, I told you my story. I think I told you my story of uh, meeting uh, Warren Beatty and saying to him at a table and saying to him, uh, just answer yes or no. And uh, I said, is your character, is he is he like Jack Kennedy? He walks the beach and he loses the girl to less um to, to less and he he said no 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 next and then he he's answering another question he turns back to me and he said uh, uh i never thought of that that's amazing and then yeah later he told somebody that he said that son of a bitch saw something in my film that i didn't say so for me it's a, it's a, it's a great uh, critical moment uh, I re- love that interviewer's song. moment and we played. We actually played that clip on one of your appearances on the show, the, the baby right. interview. Uh, right. It, it's it, the only thing that's difficult for me about that movie is I know it's entirely a Warren Beatty movie, and I I, I adore uh, Hal Ashby, <clears throat> but I know that that that's probably not an Ashby film. That that he was kind of he knew that he needed a hit, and he just took direction and abuse from Warren Beatty, who was really in right. charge of that movie. Right. Something like right. being there, or the landlord. Uh, you know, it's just stuff like the uh, last detail. I mean, that that's that's Ashby. Um, All the President's Men, I think, is a perfect movie, and it's one of the great. This might sound odd, but it's the greatest people at work movies I've ever seen, and I love movies like that. And, and it's and the, it's one of those films that has a positive ending. The yeah. uh, the fall of the of the villain, and you learn everything you need to know about them by watching them work. Uh, By the way, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was just saying, you know, this is this discussion of the of the films of the 1970s is. Going back to a class reunion or a college reunion, that it's kind of awkward. You're trying to remember who is who and what is what, and you're you're it, it awakens memories that have been buried or closeted for for 30 years. Uh, and I, I said to you before that we I could talk for for. Uh, Three hours on this. Well, I think I could talk on three days. Uh, it's inexha- inexhaustible, yeah. and it's nostalgic, and uh, it's a. Uh, it's a talk- we, we talked about, of all things, we talked about quality, 
and uh, there's something um, resonant to my uh, to me about that. Yeah. Well, I. Yeah, you, you know, sound I, like Charlie jo- Charlie Rose in the background saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Well, yeah. I know that I, 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 I get I, I get into altercations with people sometimes where they're saying there was just as much crap made in the '70s as there is today. Different and, kind of crap. Uh, yeah, I think so, and, and and I think, but but if you look at the there's place, a difference between bird droppings and horseshit. I I don't know that the that the quote unquote great movies of today will live like those great movies of the seventies because there's a relevancy in those movies made forty years ago. I I challenge you to to come up with great movies of a, a, a whole list of great movies in present time. The the, the, the movies that we're talking about challenge you. That that's a big component of what make them what makes them great, and I think so often the movies that are deemed great today offer no challenge. They're 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 so easily digestible that people think they're great because they appeal to to everyone. Well, I, well we probably should at least mention. How do you think Twelve Years a Slave would have fit into the seventies? And compare its making today with the making, if it had been the attempt to make it in the seventies. What, what do you see any difference, or do you see it being a great film, or how do you see it? Because that's the film that just won the Oscar as the best film of the year. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a big question. I uh, I don't actually know. I I don't necessarily feel a 70s sensibility in 12 Years a Slave? Do you I, see, uh, the other thing is, do you see, I think it's a good film, an important film, but do you see a personal director's vision? Do you see Steve McQueen as you know, I the artist that Scorsese is or that no. Deltman was or that Peckinpah or any of them were? I, 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 I honestly, I hate to say it, I see Steve McQueen as a sensationalist. Uh, I, I, I don't see the depth of personal vision in his films. I see a, a button pusher and, and, and look okay. out. I wouldn't go so far. I, 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 I'm not disagreeing, but I just... I wouldn't go so far as to say he's a sensationalist, although he may well be. But I don't think he has the depth of personal vision, as you said. I, I really don't see it uh, in his in his work. I I still think perhaps the the one the directors that are closest to the seventies are the Coen Brothers, because they have a personal vision. They're willing to take risks. They know what they're after they are willing to accept accident and fortuitous occurrence and uh, uh, what happens what surprises but there's a, a sense that there's a personality and a personal vision between uh, between them in their creative outlook and creative uh, creation yeah. uh, creative uh, and, 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 I, and I, I do, I do see the, I do see the Scorsese and the Altman in someone like P.T. Anderson. Um, uh, you know, I think that he's kind of like the bastard step, stepchild of. of those mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but, but you know, uh, th- three other quick titles that I always return to from the '70s are, uh, I, I do love Badlands. Um, oh, I, I do too. Oh, them. I'm glad you mentioned that because that was that's high on my list. I I I think that's a wonder. I, I I'm running out of adjectives, but but it's a memorable film, and it really worked. It really delivered on what it what Malik was after. I think. Yeah. Uh, taxi driver. That no, I go ahead. Talk, tell me. Tell me what what your reaction to it was. To Badlands. Yeah. Uh, Badlands is uh, it's one of those movies that I find completely transcendent and. Uh, it seems to me in in Malik films that 
that's the one thing he's trying to find. He's trying to find that feeling of transcendence in his movies. But the the movie that accomplished it most in his resume is is the most straightforward, which was which was Badlands. There's well, there's uh, Jamie, a, damn. Here I'm trying wonderful, and and you just go tr- transcendent. You just blew me away. You just <laughs> blew, blew me out of the. Out of the language, it's uh, transcendent, wonderful. It is transcendent. That's that's a perfect word. And oh my! God. And the, the 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 just the nature of those two performances, uh, I mean, it's just flawless. It does feel like you're in a completely different universe when you watch that movie. And there's a, a violence, but it's it's not gratuitous, and it's not in your face, and it's not it's not. Vulgarized or, or right. it's a uh, violence uh, that lives and breathes. Uh, I've already mentioned Taxi Driver, one of the great characters ever for me, Travis Bickle. Um, and then the Bergman movie I continue to return to is Cries and Whispers, and that's from '73. And an interesting story about Cries and Whispers. I, I was years ago. I was talking to Roger Corman. I'll decide whether it's interesting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Roger Corman, in, in the seventies, he bought a lot of art films, Cries and Whispers among them, and played them at drive-in theaters across the country. <laughs> I said, "What a Bergman film at a drive-in theater? That's a, how did that go over?" And he said, "Not well." But uh, <laughs> and you don't associate Corbett with you know Antonioni and Bergman films, but that was an interesting part of his background. One, one of the major things that was was so important and indelible in the '60s was you would go to an art theater and see the latest Truffaut or the latest Bergman, and Bergman was sensational. I mean, his 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 appeal on the art art film circuit was extraordinary. Now he's he's a forgotten director. Hardly anybody remem- remembers Ingmar Bergman. Um, and then at a certain point, probably probably in the 70s, in the late 70s, all these art theaters t- turned into adult film f- theaters, uh, porno theaters. And the foreign film, which was so much a part of awakening these directors and giving them a a, a sense of self and style and, and promise and potential, came from France and Italy and, and the great, great foreign directors. And that was a part of film that is gone because we don't very seldom do we hear, Oh, you've got to see this French film or you've got to see the, the, the new film by whoever it may be, a, a tornatore. Um, you don't hear that anymore. And it used to be that, that Kale, Saris, Simon, uh, McDonald, Haskell, David Elliott, who's one of my favorites, who wrote for in Chicago and then San Diego, they always wrote about the new films that came from Europe, and there was a tremendous uh, enthusiasm for it that has just disappeared. And when it's like part of the of the world of movies is defunct; it is no more. Well, all of these direct, all of these American directors that we've talked about tonight, we wouldn't have them without the Bergmans and Kur- Kurosawa, particularly, uh, and, and Antonioni, and all of these French New Wave artists and foreign directors. They wouldn't exist because they were in. And we shouldn't life. forget, we shouldn't forget Fellini either, because Fellini, I still think La Dolce Vita, all the all the the the, the, the orgy scene is so dated, but I still think his sense of alienation. Is as strong as is on as has been put on film, especially at the end of La Dolce Vita, where the Marcello uh, Mastriani character is standing alone with uh, only a party around him, nothing that makes yeah. any 
that has any meaning or has any 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 significance at all. Scarecrow is a film I love that I constantly return to uh, mm-hmm. with Pacino and Hackman, one of the best Hackman performances in that movie. Um, you know, the, in, in terms of horror films, uh, I, you know, I think Texas Chainsaw is the granddaddy, uh, and I think that I think that because it, a lot of people fight me on this, but I think that horror films sh- can be taken seriously as an art uh, form because horror, by its very nature, can really get at the the the, the submersive kind of social and political landscape of the time. It, it, without beating you over the head with it, even even when people are being beaten over the head during the movie. Uh, okay, Alfie, I have a, a, an assignment for you, your listeners, especially the psychologically oriented. Try and figure out what. Try and figure out what makes a person who loves both Texas Chainsaw Massacre <laughs> and Barry Manilow. Now that's a, that's. I know. That's a psychological profile right there. That, yeah. That's great. 